Welcome back to another episode of The Marketing Moment with DV Dynamo. I am your host, David Berry, with Julia Reynolds, my co-host, always here with you guys on Tuesdays. Julia, what's uh, what's the word on your side of the, of the screen this morning? Not much. Just ready for this podcast. That's right. <laughs> well, we've got a, a good episode for you. I would say exciting. Not, I can't always proclaim that digital media is exciting. But what I can say is that this one is is useful, practical, and very timely as well. So, before we kick things off, uh, the marketing moment, if you're a first time listener, is the podcast that we as an agency put together, DB Dynamo. We're an agency that focuses on selling products for the body. So if your customers eat it or wear it, we help you sell it. And this is our way for us to talk about our quote unquote thought leadership in this category, but also to provide actionable, useful insights for you as e-commerce and direct to consumer marketers that you can take and apply to your own businesses. So today, What we're going to talk about is diversifying your media mix, but more specifically, Facebook has really just come out and announced something that is pretty significant in terms of the targeting that uh, capabilities that they are constantly trying to change and improve right now in real time based on the iOS 14 rollout, which I feel like we talk about every week. So I'm going to start by talking about the question that still remains. Our clients are coming to us all the time talking about how do they get better value out of Facebook and Google? And how do they potentially diversify their media mix to make sure that they're getting better value in general? We're going to talk about this new change that Facebook announced and explain why it matters, but it still doesn't matter in the sense that you still should be diversifying your media mix. So let's let's get into it, and hopefully it'll make a little bit more sense as we get, as we do get in there. Um, and, and to tee it off, which which I had said, of all the things we're talking about with our clients these days, this is the thing that comes up the most: is what should I be doing on Facebook, and should I be changing how I'm advertising to my clients? And to answer that question, I'm going to start with a few facts. The first one is that Facebook and Google have been a good value for a long time. Good value meaning you get a lot out of it without having to spend as much. Nice dollar for dollar value. But they aren't anymore. Facebook is expensive. Google is expensive. They are no longer the good value that they were for, for many years. I'll give you an example. One client that we have uh, spends $33 million a year on digital ads. They've seen their Facebook ad costs rise 114% year over year. And their Google ad costs have jumped 38%. And that's not isolated. We have another client who spends $400,000 a year on Facebook, and they're paying 31% more this year. Just to explain that more simply, if you sell a product for $50 and you paid $25 last year to get a transaction, you had a two to one return, which is solid. But if your ad costs went up 100%, which we've already shown has happened with some of our clients, now all of a sudden that product is still $50, but now it also costs you $50 to sell it. And that's not good. So clients are asking us two questions. One, how do I still get good value out of the big two, really Facebook and Google? And the second part is what other channels should I be advertising on? So as I mentioned, I'm gonna start with Facebook and talk about this big announcement that just came out because this partly affects the answer um, in in one way, but not in the other. So in Facebook's latest API release, this is sort of a piece of news that they hid almost under the radar. This is something that was word for word included in that update. When advertisers leverage detailed targeting and optimize for conversions, value, or app events using the conversions objective, they will be automatically included into targeting expansion. So side note, targeting expansion enables Facebook's ad algorithms to show your ads to a broader potential audience than those who fit your specific ad targeting selections. So another thing that they said in the same release was you can use this option when you want when you want us to show your ad to additional people who we think would get more um, and or cheaper results. And our system implements targeting expansion when it determines that doing so could improve performance. So let's translate this. Facebook's system is basically saying that it may detect that your ads would see better response if they were shown to more users outside of the scope of your targeting. So you picked one, two, three parameters as your audience group and Facebook says, yeah, but in addition to that, here's some things we think it'll make it better. So it's going to do that and it'll show your ads based on its own estimations, even if those people, like I said, don't fit the target groups that you've explicitly selected. Now, there are some important provisions to this. Most notably, the targeting expansion doesn't apply to location, age, or gender targeting options. So if you're Joe's Pizza Shop in Miami targeting college students 18 to 22, your ads will still only be shown to that subset. But within that subset, if there are additional people who Facebook thinks your ads might be valuable to, it may automatically push beyond your parameters and show them the ad. So it's it's maybe not as dramatic as it sounds like because there are still some, some limitations to it. The question you might be asking is, 
wow, is that a good thing? It kind of sounds like Facebook is, is taking the reins from you as the advertiser and, and becoming the evil giant. I think that's for you to decide. If you can't step even an inch outside of your target audience exactly as you define them, then no, this is probably not a good thing for you. But in most cases, I do think most brands want desirable in-market customers who would buy their products. And in this case, that could be to their advantage. And basically, since iOS 14 rolled out and, and really since Facebook has existed in general, Facebook's ad targeting systems are getting much smarter. And that's the bet that we're all taking is that they're smart enough to make some of these decisions for us. And here's the, the wild card. It's already in place. Targeting expansion is now added by default to most convert, conversion-based campaigns, and you might not be able to opt out of it. But you can still exclude certain groups, which is obviously critical. So if you had said, you know, we don't want to include past customers or whatever, you know, certain lookalike groups, whatever, you can still exclude certain groups. It's just going to default to working a little bit more around the edges to find people who fit into your audience. So in a world you know, where, where Facebook is, is constantly changing. This is the latest in that long list of things. I don't think this is as dramatic as it might sound. Um, there's a lot of flexibility that's, you know, still within the targeting for you, but it's worth monitoring. But I'm going to zoom out a little bit and, and talk about the broader picture at hand here. The bigger problem still remains. Let's say Facebook is getting better at prospecting and finding new conversions and things like that. The, the dilemma is it's still going to be expensive, whether Facebook helps you improve or not, the overall ad structure and cost is just more than it was. So despite the way you'll be targeting users, it's the optimization. Are you aiming for awareness or clicks or traffic or sales conversions that you need to revisit still? In our world as, as advertisers and marketers, we're encouraging many of our clients to stop optimizing every campaign for conversions. You're basically trying to breathe air through the same straw of marketers who only want the users who are ready to buy right now. But why? The reason we're telling our clients to come off of that is because that's where most of the competition is and that's where the costs are rising the most. Where costs have not risen as high is where Facebook has actually, in my estimation, always been at its best. And that's at the top and the middle of the funnel with users who are discovering your product and learning more about it. CPMs and CPCs are still a decent value in those parts of the funnel. And here's something that I think marketers are reluctant to accept even before iOS 14, but certainly more now, not everyone buys through Facebook ads. In fact, I would venture to say most people don't. And in the past, even when it looked like they were, Facebook has been notorious for overinflating the role Facebook had in driving transactions, but we love the ROAS metric and we blindly trusted it. Even if Google Analytics or Shopify or both were telling us a different story. This comes down to understanding the user journey of your customers, your specific customers. So, and I'm going to make some generalizations to color that, but social media channels are generally for discovering things. Most times you don't go to Instagram or, talk, or TikTok to buy something, at least when you compare it to Google or going directly to a website, which is where most people are when they are ready to buy. They go either to the Google machine or they go directly to the website of the, of the brand they're trying to buy from. And yes, we do buy through social, but more than that, we discover through social. We learn, we educate ourselves, and then we buy later. Uh, and sometimes, you know, we're relying on retargeting to help us do that. But from a prospecting perspective, it's really about learning and discovering. So if you're seeing diminishing returns on Facebook, or rather, we know that you are at this point, you need to match your ad strategy to what you know about your losers, <laughs> your losers. Well, <laughs> your users. I don't know if we if we cut that out or just keep it because that was <laughs> I think it's funny. <laughs> all right all right we're gonna keep going <laughs> you, it's don't basically want your about, users to be losers you don't want your users to be losers <laughs> uh you have to build an ad strategy that shows you know about your users so look at your google analytics i'll bet that most of your sales are coming from either site direct traffic organic search paid search or a mixture of four or five touch points across a number of different channels that probably still includes direct site traffic or google in it Social channels are notoriously not as significant in driving transactions as we like them as advertisers to think that they are. So in terms of diversifying the media mix, here's, here's what I would look at. I would understand that you, this notion of performance marketing is, is still real, the ability to use ads and, and finally tune them to get results that prove that you drove revenue or lifetime value, whatever the case is but you're not gonna always be able to ignore all stages of the funnel. I think Facebook in some ways made digital advertisers a little bit lazy in the sense that they could just put an ad on Facebook and everything would work out and yay, we're building a business. It's not working that way anymore, especially for people who have 
you know, products that are selling for 50 or $60 and the average shopping cart is, you know, 70 or 80 bucks or, or not higher than that. It's hard to get a ROAS of three or four or five to one when the thing that you're selling is 50 or 60 bucks. So the opportunity there is just, is just a lot different. So here's where we recommend generally speaking to go in diversifying your media mix and delivering value at the top of the funnel, use social media channels, but maybe move off of Facebook. For example, we see a lot of people, you know, we have several skincare brands in our portfolio and women 25 to 34 make up a big part of the, the buyer contingent for a lot of them. But instead of just pushing everybody into the same Facebook funnel, we're now getting our brands to push harder on TikTok and on Snapchat and on YouTube and focusing on driving down CPMs on those channels and then allowing the retargeting pools to get bigger and then retargeting across a number of channels. And that becomes a much more valuable cost-effective way of, of implementing your marketing mix because now you're not asking Facebook to drive the conversion at all times through prospecting. You're letting retargeting do that. And it's always much more cost efficient to do that. Second part is when you do a very good job of building awareness and, and consideration to your website, you also have the benefit of more people knowing who the hell you are in the first place. So if I type in Julia's plant store, which uh, I know is something she hopes to open one day soon, um, you know, through social media ads, where do you think I'm going to go the next time I, I want to actually go to the physical store? In most scenarios, it's not to go back to Instagram to look to see where her store is. No, a lot of times people are saying, if I'm ready to buy, I'm going to go to Google or I'm going to go to directly to her website at that point to find out what there is for sale. So you want to feed that user behavior. And what you'll notice is an increase in branded search terms. So nobody knew who Julia's plant store was yesterday. Very sad. But then she runs a whole bunch of Facebook and Instagram and TikTok ads. And what do you, what do you notice? All of a sudden, the number of organic searches for Julia's plant store go up. Well, how do you think that happened <laughs> from running awareness and consideration ad campaigns that weren't immediately optimized for purchase, but eventually did lead to purchase? So we could talk about this all day, and I think we will, not literally today, <laughs> but in future episodes, we'll get a little bit more granular with some case studies with how we've diversified the media mix for some of our clients and showing you how that's been effective and impactful for a lot of them. Uh, but I am going to hit the pause button for now. Cause I think we've covered a lot of ground, especially with this update with expansion targeting on Facebook, but Julia, what are your initial thoughts and, um, and any reactions, some things that you're seeing and hearing as well? Obviously expanding audiences is something that we have been doing for our clients right now. We're expanding the one to 6% lookalike. It used to be one to 4%. And then the past couple months for a client, we, we made it to 6% per Facebook's recommendation. Um, so I think this will, be a time-saving feature, hopefully, that we won't have to do these, all these, you know, manually constructed audience testing um, if Facebook can just figure it out for us and let the machines do it, you know? Yeah. I so. think that's a, a really good point and actually brings up what I think could be the implication that I think is good. Instead of focusing on like fine-tuning between like, oh, this audience is you know, a lookalike of blank a blank, and this one's a lookalike of blank a blank. Like you're you're splitting hairs. Instead, it forces you to focus on making sure the messaging and the creative is strong. Mm -hmm. I think, and and ultimately, that's really what what advertising is about: is the ability to inform, educate, and compel. At the end of the day, I don't think people are really compelled by being in the right target audience if the creative still sucks. Um, and I think that's what's happened is a lot of advertisers thought Facebook was so easy. So they just would take a stock image, put their logo on top of it and say, we made an ad. And, and I mean, in a technical sense you did, but you didn't compel anybody. You just, you just put up a graphic of something, you know, like we sell pizza. Awesome. Well, here's a pizza graphic. Well, no, what's, why is your pizza better? Why, why do I need to choose, you know, your pizza over, over Joe's pizza, the imaginary one I made up earlier. Um, I think creative is going to become uh, not, not that it ever became unimportant, but re advertisers are going to be reminded of just how important good intentional creative is. And I think that that's going to be a reemergence that we should be looking at. So that's a, a very good point. But Awesome. Well, that is what we had for you today. And uh, hopefully you learned a little something and a couple of things to take away with you as you're looking to diversify your own media mix and also understanding how you might be able to change some of your Facebook ad targeting. So if you had some uh, some value from this, we're grateful. Don't forget to subscribe and, and listen to future episodes. And we will be back every Tuesday with more information for you to take to your work, whether you're an agency or a client working directly on your own brand. 
Don't forget to subscribe on Stitcher, on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify. And uh, you can always watch our, our beautiful, beautiful mugs on YouTube as well. And we'll see you next week. Bye. Thank you.